Good morning, everybody. Hi, it's um, Cassandra Goldie here um, and a very a warm welcome to people who are dialing in for um, this next um, very important instalment in the ACOS policy webinar series, which um, we're very delighted is being sponsored by our friends at HESTA. Um, so welcome to HESTA people. Um, the um, topic for the webinar today is about community leadership in times of crisis and um, I'm very pleased indeed that um, firstly um, we are joined by Auntie Anne Weldon who is going to provide us with a welcome to country. Hello Auntie Anne, I know you, I saw you there on the tech platform so just really so pleased that you've been able to join us this morning. I know that we've got people uh, participating today from all over the country. So um, thank you, Auntie Anne. Thank you very much, ACOS, for inviting me to uh, conduct a welcome to country of your webinar seminar today. Um, just for, for, to make people aware of it, my name is Anne Weldon. I am a Wiradjuri Koori Balan, and I'm also a member of Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council. And uh, it is with their permission that I um, actually am before you all today. And I acknowledge all Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters, as many of you no doubt are, are near and far across this incredible continent of ours. Um, for the particular part of Aboriginal land that I'm on, it is the Eora Nations country, and I um, am in the clan group area of Gadigal here in Sydney. And whenever you travel across this or you're in this, you're a part in our Aboriginal country, you are either travelling through or are on land of a nation, a tribe or a clan. And I acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land that I gather on here today. And that is the land of the Gadigal people of the mighty Eora Nation. And the Gadigal were one of 29 clan groups of the mighty Eora Nation. And I acknowledge my respects to all Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people um, across our country. But first and foremost, I certainly uh, pay my respects to all Elders past, present and emerging from uh, many Aboriginal nations who made, the sac made many, many sacrifices to create a better future for us all. For my people, we have been a part of these lands that stretches far beyond 60,000 years. And Aboriginal nations of Australia, we are one of the longest unbroken threads of human culture on the planet. And there are many Aboriginal nations and tribes and we are certainly bound by the same unifying elements of culture. And we have one of the world's old, longest, sorry, the world's oldest religious systems and there are many different language groups. And my people certainly look with pride upon the depth and the richness of our culture and we adhere to our spiritual commitments to the land and to each other. And it has been through fortitude, courage and wisdom that we have survived. But undeniably, history has certainly dealt my people unjust treatment and sadly we continue to be paralysed by these unfortunate injustices. But our practices of culture and language has been handed down to hundreds and hundreds of generations and certainly I'm hand, I've handed it on to my children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews and I certainly will be handing it on to my great grand nephew a great-grandson, rather. For I learnt my Wiradjuri culture and traditions by the teaching and by listening to my elders. For my elders informed the truth from their lived experiences and the facts are seen through their eyes. And our ancestors left us the legacy that gave us strength to continue when all seems lost, to stay strong and to know that there are many ways to achieve what we believe in, and that is a just and chill outcome. And they left us a legacy of love and the ability to find laughter in the, in the worst of times. And this is how we certainly hand down and teach our children of those times that have been experienced by previous generations before them. And that came from the keepers of our wisdom and knowledge and I call them our strong clever ones. And I share with you as an average, as a Koori Balan, that my history is a story of daring, of courage, and certainly of resourcefulness. And as a Wiradjuri Koori Balan, I call upon all Australians to celebrate with us and for Australia to pave the way to ensure 
that Aboriginal people share the wealth and the prosperity that our country has to offer. And in doing this with us, instead of people making decisions for us, it will enable Aboriginal people to create our own pathways and reach our own full potential. And the boundaries for the country that I actually um, am on today within the Eora Nation spans from the Hawke's River to the north, the Nepean to the west and the Georges River to the south. So it is with permission uh, on behalf of Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council that I welcome you to the land of the mighty Eora Nation and indeed acknowledge that you are all on the land of other many Aboriginal nations around our country. I want to thank ACOS again for allowing me to conduct the work of the country. I hope that your uh, Wimba Forum, uh, you know, is, is, is successful and all of you uh, certainly enjoy and have, have input uh, within this particular forum. Um, there is one special request I ask everybody every time when I, when I conduct the welcome is for each and every one of us to remember our loved ones that have passed over before us, the incredible giants that have allowed us to stand on their shoulders, the beautiful people that are beside you now, but more importantly, those gorgeous, precious little ones that follow in our footsteps. So may my people's spirit walk and guide all of us as we continue on our journey together and let that journey be one where we can and will continue to make our country the best in the world. So once again, welcome to the land of Aboriginal people, but where I am, it's Eora Nation. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much for that really delightful um, welcome to country and that, that notion of celebration. I think it's, you know, at the moment, it's so important with, you know, some many, many tough days people to have a sense of that as well um, and in the event that we're having this morning we are going to be also talking and celebrating and learning from the storytelling and the experiences of First Nations leadership you know in the context of the bushfires in the context of this pandemic in the context of ongoing struggles for social justice and human rights and I'm really um, I, I want to acknowledge the country that I have been really privileged to be on and now for quite a long time without moving much on Gadigal land um, and pay re my respects to your elders past, present and emerging and the little ones. Um, I'm really delighted that you've been able to come to um, be present with us this morning and to help to set that scene for us. I know, as I said, we've got um, almost 70 people um, joining us today and they are coming from all over the country in a way that we've continued to be able to do, you know, uniquely in a sense of this sort of virtual life that we're now leading. Yeah. Um, and I think that, ha that I invite people, participants, to in this moment reflect on the various lands, First Nations lands of Australia where we are. And, um, again, my um, sincere thanks to you for, um, you know, welcoming us to this very important discussion today. Thank you, Annie Ann. Thank you. Um, I would like just now to, um, before we um, I, um, then move through to um, introduce you to our fantastic um, panellists, if I can just ha hand over to um, my colleague, um, Danny, who is our events coordinator, who's just going to do a little bit of housekeeping for you. We do have a great turnout this morning, and so just wanting to make sure that you've got the support that you need. Thanks, Danny. No worries, Cass. Um, so I just wanted to flag that speakers and technical support have video and audio options today. Um, we'd love for participants to participate in the Q&A session by using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, and if there's a question that you think is important, you can upvote it by clicking the thumbs up. Uh, if you'd like to use audio to pose your question during the Q&A, please let me know via the chat function, just flagging that you'd like to ask a question in person. Um, if you have dialed in by phone, you can send me any questions to danny at acos.org.au. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded. And if you have any technical issues, just use the chat function to ask questions and our techni technical support team will help you out. Thanks. So again, um, welcome everybody. Um, this um, webinar today, the core theme of it is about community leadership in times of crisis. Um, and um, we're really um, 
so pleased that we've got a fantastic um, group of panellists who are going to be joining me um, as we look at some of the lessons learned and experiences that um, communities have been through and continue to um, face in the context of particularly of the bushfires, um, the COVID-19 pandemic, obviously, and the very serious um, economic and social aspects of that, and are taking an even longer lens looking at um, what we've learned with Australia having been at the forefront of succeeding in dealing with a crisis like the HIV um, virus crisis that um, confronted Australia and continues to be an ongoing piece of work. Um, ACOS has, of course, um, done um, what it can to continue to be a voice to support um, and speak to the vital role that civil society plays in um, leading and being on the ground at the forefront of um, a crisis situation, being prepared to deal with crises, being in the rapid response associated with crises, and then often a very long tail of recovery associated with supporting communities. Um, and um, I don't think we could have asked for a better um, gathering of people today on our panel to speak to some of the very personal experiences, the experiences from your, yourselves and communities you particularly represent, um, and to share with us some of your insights and learnings. Um, so I am really delighted if I can just particularly introduce, first of all, Victor, Victor Stephenson. Welcome, Victor. It's really wonderful to have you with us. Um, and just a little bit about Victor's background. Um, Victor was inspired by his mum and his grandmother's heritage, um, the Tagalaka people of northern Queensland. Um, and Victor's work began in 1991. Um, recognising the urgent need to record the invaluable wisdom of elders. And, of course, you've heard from Annie Ann as well, Victor, you know, talking about that um, before that knowledge is lost. And over many years, through Victor's love of the arts, the arts, gee, we need them now, um, filmmaking, culture and the environment, um, your work um, has been about re-engaging traditional knowledge practices through creative community projects. Um, and Victor co-founded... Fire Sticks Alliance. Um, I've heard so many amazing things about that work, Victor, um, and um, founded the Living Knowledge Place, an educational platform based on community and Indigenous methods. Victor released a book in amongst all of that in February 2020, The Country, uh, Fire Country, How Indigenous Fire Management Could Help Save Australia. And I'm happy to do a plug, Victor, for that that publication. Um, there's a lot of deep knowledge in there. Victor's story is unassuming and honest, whilst demonstrating the incredibly sophisticated and complex cultural knowledge that has been passed down to him, which we now are very fortunate to have the opportunity to listen to and to be learning from. So a very warm welcome to you, Victor. Good morning. Uh, yeah, great. Great to have you. Secondly, if I could just introduce Daryl O'Donnell. Um, Daryl will be known to um, many of the ACOS members who are joining the discussion. And just to highlight, we've got many from ACOS membership, but also very broadly across Australia. Um, Daryl is the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Federation of AIDS Organisation, and AFAO leads Australia's national community-led effort to end HIV, to end HIV, Daryl, um, and support stronger civil society responses to HIV, but also in Asia and the Pacific. Um, Daryl has more than 25 years deep experience and expertise in the HIV community research and public sector roles. And in addition to his community roles, he holds an adjunct appointment as professor at the University of New South Wales. And um, those of you who know Daryl know how very generous he is in drawing on his depth of experience to um, help to inform wider discussions about what we need as a country to make Australia a better and safer place. So a very warm welcome to you, Daryl. Thank you. Well, great to have you. Um, and then um, finally, I'm really delighted, um, Chris Christoforo, who is um, in Melbourne. Yes, Chris, can I just double check? That is the literally the place where you are um, and is Executive Officer of the Ethnic Communities Council of Victoria. Of course, um, 
I don't think really we need to kind of verbalise what it, what to understand the challenges in the environment, Chris, that you have been, you know, working in and leading. And um, we're really very, very privileged that you've chosen to take some time out of your frontline work and working with people in Melbourne and in Victoria um, at the moment to share some of your insights and learnings with us. Um, of course, um, the Ethnic Communities Council of Victoria is a member-based peak body for ethnic and multicultural organisations in Victoria and a part of um, a very important member of ACOS, FECA, of course, um, and Chris's management and executive experience across the education, community and sports sectors over the last two decades have included senior management positions with, and just listen to this, Western Bulldogs, Mission Australia, Box Hill Institute, um, also served on a, a number of not-for-profit boards, including Lentil as Anything, what a great initiative that is, um, Capital City LLEN, and Latitude Directions for Young People. Um, you're a teacher by background, um, Chris, and so, of course, that's such a core skill set at the moment um, and has such a very deep commitment to inclusion and empowerment of marginalised communities throughout um, his career, including collaborating and working with First Nations people. Um, so I'm just really delighted, Chris, also to um, have you join our panel. A very warm welcome to you, Chris. Thanks, Cassandra. Much it's appreciated. It's great to have you all here. Um, look, I just wanted to... Um, so what we're going to do, everybody, is we're going to spend about um, um, 30 minutes or so um, exploring some discussion amongst the, um, the panellists, um, and then we will open up for an opportunity for contributions for participants. We've got a lot of people with a lot of, you know, frontline and other experience as well. And, of course, as Danny said, please do pose your questions as you're listening, and then in the second half of the um, event today, we will be coming to you and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions of Victor, Daryl and Chris as well. But I'm wondering if I can just firstly come to you, Victor, again, a very warm welcome and, um, you know, understanding the background and the sort of role, your concept of why you were part of founding the Fire Sticks Alliance um, and your recognition of the critical role of First Nations and Aboriginal community leadership during, if you can just speak to what it's been like for you through the bushfire season that we've just had and some of your first observations about what it's been like to be a community leader in that environment over the last year. Thanks, Victor. Over to you. Uh, thanks for that. And uh, firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge country as well and um, acknowledge um, all the communities involved in this important work around the country. And yes, um, I'm a lead fire practitioner with um, Fire Sticks. And basically, Fire Sticks has been developed um, through communities and involved communities all around the country. And it was a need to put that sort of platform in place to support um, the communities in some way. And it's in early development stages. Um, to try and beef the capacity of the communities and um, create that opportunity as well as um, breaking down all the barriers as well um, within um, all the challenges across the board um, with getting such an activity um, happening in this nation. Um, the wildfires were, um, you know, was a hectic time. It was just like a big wave of um, inundated <laughs> with just you know, the responses from people, the grief from people. Uh, but more importantly now, the need to recover. And so many people, um, we just can't answer all the emails in terms of private um, landowners to um, land management agencies, um, all sorts of um, um, people from all walks of life, Aboriginal communities that want to get these programs going. And what's really good to see is that um, there's a big change in this nation and the attitudes of people now um, towards Indigenous knowledge, but also um, the need for change in general, um, to start working together, and a real need to start looking at things differently um, than what we have currently been looking at country, um, you know, since um, colonisation Australia. So we've come to a point where, um, you know, um, there's a real need for support for the communities 
and um, trying to build that support for communities is where we're at at the moment. Um, and, um, you know, we're really happy to say that Firesticks has got some employment happening and we've got positions that are going to help with the process now and facilitate workshops and um, requests in different regions in the country. Um, it's just a start at the moment, but hopefully that's going to pan into training programs for different regions and, you know, hopefully employment for people in those regions to start managing landscapes and not just managing landscapes, but also educating the community, looking at all the other benefits that come from this that feed into um, education, feed into assisting the agricultural sector um, for livelihoods, um, feeding into supporting, um, you know, environment groups and just what people can do in general on a, on a community level. And it really is about community. And it's about community pulling together and making those first steps and not waiting for um, it to happen from somewhere else or wait for the government to make the decisions. This is really um, something that communities need to take charge of and work together with. And it's really important that Aboriginal people are involved in that process so that everything moves together and that we step on the right stepping stones to, um, to evolve this culture and evolve everyone's understanding of fire and the general Australian culture um, to start living with the country a little bit more closely and um, looking at more um, proactive, um, you know, things, what are proactive ways forward rather than um, waiting for the, you know, disasters and response um, approach that is usually the case in, in Western sort of management um, streams. Victor, can I just pick up on something there? Thank you. You you mentioned there about the sort of in the sort of context of the crisis of that last summer, um, the sort of the building of community um, as well as existing community. What to what extent did you feel that the it was about um, supporting existing community leadership? Cult, you know, it was already culturally well and truly established mm. and to what extent did you feel like it those kinds of cultural practices and support networks had been undermined and you needed to rebuild just get a sense of that yeah well you know the the, the always been the aim to beef up the, the capacities of the communities and you know and for us it was beefing up the capacity of the indigenous communities because it's so important for um the well-being and to get out of the welfare situations and the social challenges as well for our mob. And getting access to country is really, has always been the aspiration of all the elders. And, um, and what we're seeing is really um, exciting is that now since those fires, um, we have ranger groups and in the southern areas of Australia that are now getting access to thousands of hectares of land through, um, you know, councils and main roads departments and so forth. And you know, that's really amazing. And what that has shown is that, you know, we've been doing this for, for a long time now, well over a decade, and doing workshops around the nation and um, educating people. And there have been thousands of people um, across many states in this country that are um, already linked into, um, you know, this important work and initiative. And there are so many communities that are doing it also on their own bat outside of um, this as well. And it all... It is um, a collective in um, getting that awareness out to the general Australia. And when those fires happened, people saw that Indigenous knowledge was there. We've been there for ever since, um, trying to get a, a hand in, and a foot in the door to manage this landscape. And um, so that has never changed. And um, it's just the fires now that have happened have, have really um, swung in a direction that, you know, we need to get these programs going and, you know, and it's something that we want to see for non-Indigenous people too. Uh, you know, that's the thing about this. This is about everyone. And if we're going to be looking at a solution to support everyone, then we need to be respecting people and we need to be respecting place and respecting this country for what it is and um, the, the knowledge that comes from this landscape and the people that come from that landscape. And from there, building on that practical knowledge base that, supports everybody into the future in a way that erases the confusion, erases the um, erases the fear that um, people have 
um, and the the commitment to fight the fire um, is turned into um, you know looking after our landscapes a lot more and a wealth of education that should be passive that should be um, accessible for all Australians and um, when we look at that it's it's it really is an exciting time and um, you know the benefits that will come from that will be will just be sevenfold and we can't continue to just look at landscapes as a devastation and we can't continue to look at it as a fear uh, and just one-sided views of just hazard reduction we need to look at um, it in a more open-minded space that brings in a wealth of opportunity and excitement for our young people rather than um, the doom and gloom approach and it's also certainly something that our um, that people need who have been traumatized by the fires in different places around this country and have lost houses and lost loved ones. Um, it's crucial right across the board that um, that this connecting to landscapes and understanding our country better and contributing to a positive solution is um, is really what needs to come from this. And you know, and it's respecting pe people and respecting the, this great nation that will um, get us the first stepping stones in that direction. To, I, I'll come back to, you talk about getting your foot in the door. We might talk a bit further in a moment about way, yeah. ways, to, ways to do that. Chris, I, if I can just come to you, um, Victor talked very powerfully there about sort of the emotions of fear in communities and how to support people going to a place of we have confidence to move, confidence to lead, and what's required there. I mean, of course, you've, you know, you, as I say, you're still at the front line of responding to what's going on in, in Victoria and in communities. Just wondering if you can maybe build on that to share some of your current insights about um, what, what it's been like to be a community leader in this environment over the last months. Um, and to what extent you are seeing that kind of support for community leadership and where it's not been happening. Yeah, thanks, Cassandra. Um, I guess I think there are, you know, leadership actions that are happening every day. I think, you know, it's not... Uh, it, there's there's, there's genuine, genuinely a, a will uh, here in uh, Victoria to, to work together, to collaborate... Um, but I guess there's there's something that just is not right. And I think sort of going going back to what Victor was saying in terms of uh, you know communities having uh, control, communities having voice, uh, communities being front and centre of the response. I think that that is really the missing piece. So we've de we've definitely seen that uh, from our perspective with uh, multicultural communities here in Victoria, where. I guess, despite the level of diversity that's um, a feature of our of our of our society, um, unfortunately, the responses have been, uh, you know, quite superficial uh, in terms of addressing addressing that diversity and including it as part of the response. So I think that uh, governments, uh, the government here, has has definitely had a, a a really strong will to to try to try to engage, try to communicate. Um, and try to try to respond, but for some reason, there are some systemic issues in terms of uh, a lot of triangulation in between government, between communities, and between between the community services sector. So, you know, there needs to be there needs to be some yeah, I guess some some change that 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 sort of comes from this. Uh, uh, sort of building on what Victor said in, in terms of including including diversity as as front and center as part of our planning as part of and as part of the response and also obviously as part of the recovery. And just Chris, um, can you give it? Were there some good examples of where you felt that the community was at the center of the decision making? you know, some of, or has that been a kind of a battle all the way to keep trying to, in, you know, insert into other places where decisions are being made? Yeah, I mean, I think the most obvious one is the is the public housing tower lockdowns in um, in Flemington, North Melbourne, in, in inner Melbourne. Um, they were obviously imposed on communities um, and... And unfortunately, that sort of disjuncture between, I guess, what what government sees as a, pr as a priority 
and how that sort of intersects with where people are at and what their needs are. I think that that, yeah, it was really a, in that moment where that was a failed response, you know, to, to put it bluntly. And, and I think, you know, the way that sort of communities who, who are considered sort of vulnerable, marginalised, that risk, were able to really sort of demonstrate how empowered they are, even with limited resources, with limited infrastructure, to really sort of mobilise and, and try to embed themselves within, within a, a broader sort of systemic response. I think that was quite inspiring. Yeah. Yeah, so many, so many examples of that. Yeah, Chris. Oh, definitely, um, definitely. Yeah, it's uh, young people, young people uh, just taking charge. You know, young people from those communities. You know, because and basically being that intermediary for uh, for their elders as well, who who were um, who were obviously shell shocked by uh, you know by by being incarcerated. Yeah. And, and Daryl, just, um, you know, having had those sort of initial insights from both Victor and Chris about, at the moment, quite recent, current, you know, very serious crises that communities have been dealing with, can you just speak a bit to what resonates about your long history of, you know, from the beginning of the HIV crisis and what was happening right back then and what you saw grow out of that to, mm. in terms of community-led response? Yeah. Um, thanks, Cass. And um, I, I just want to begin by also acknowledging a uh, country I'm uh, very fortunate to live and work on uh, the land of the Gadigal people uh, of the Eora Nation. Um, and uh, I want to celebrate and, uh, and recognise, you know, uh, we all live in a country with 80,000 years of, of history, of unbroken history. Uh, and so for a discussion about community, uh, for a discussion about the strength and the resilience of community, um, what, a, what an important thing for us to have uh, heard from Auntie Anne and from, from Victor uh, about that. Um, I, I think for me, uh, you know, when I think about community leadership, I think Auntie Anne told us the answer to this. Uh, there's a a permission uh, that's given uh, for uh, uh, for people to speak as community leaders, and that permission uh, is earned and is precious, and it has accountability attached to it, and it can be taken away. Uh, and so, uh, when when we step forward as community leaders, uh, our first duty is to those uh, who we serve, uh, and that deep accountability to those we serve. Um, in the HIV crisis, um, you know, to pick up on, on Victor's point, uh, you know, we, we've had a relatively enlightened kind of response to HIV over the last three and a half decades in Australia. Government, I think, understood uh, fairly early that it had a problem it couldn't solve. Uh, it needed uh, people, people in the community, to voluntarily agree to do things, uh, to give up things, uh, and to do that indefinitely until we had a vaccine or a cure, and we have neither of those things nearly four decades later. Uh, and so government recognised we can't do this without community, and so we're going to have to talk to community. Uh, and I, I think there's some resonance in terms of what's gone wrong or going wrong in COVID. The government thinks it can do this on its own. Um, but for HIV, it got that, and, uh, and it allowed... Uh, communities to be supported by government, but uh, government got to the table really late. So the early years of this were uh, gay men, uh, often young in their 20s and 30s, who were dying, who were um, uh, unwell, who were you know, very profoundly and visibly unwell before a test, uh, before anyone knew what was happening and understood what was happening, uh, and uh, uh, at a time of incredible hysteria and anxiety and panic. Uh, and what happened was... Uh, as communities, um, gay men and allies and uh, later on sex workers and people who use drugs rallied around each other and said, um, uh, if irrespective of what anyone else does, uh, we can't uh, uh, walk away from each other. So let's do everything we can uh, to find our way through this, to muddle our way as best we can, whether that's you know, uh, uh, allowing someone to die at home and being by their bedside um, uh, and, uh, and, and giving them a dignified uh, death, whether it's, uh, you know, throwing a fabulous 
funeral and celebration, uh, whether it's educating uh, each other about, you know, what's actually going on and how do we make sense of this and is this thing transmitted and how is it transmitted and what could we do to stop that and, you know, uh, all of those things happened before government. The first, first funding for a HIV campaign in Australia was actually from Mardi Gras, uh, not from government. It was a community saying there's something really important happening for us and we've got to get the word out. We've got to uh, talk amongst ourselves and make sense of this and work out how it is that we're going to get through this together. Um, so community is really powerful and, and community leadership for me is fundamentally about consent. It's about, um, it's about leadership that... Uh, recognises the strengths of the aspirations of the lived realities of those that uh, we serve um, and uh, takes that uh, as a voice and, uh, and uh, both to government and to the wider community, um, but also works back within our own communities. Um, I, I think some of the challenges for HIV when I think about community leadership are as much as, as, much as this is a response driven by those who carry its burden. Uh, we also got that we need others. Um, you know, there's so much we can do, but there's so much more we need and we need government to be at the table with us. We need researchers to be there with us to help us understand what's happening. Uh, we need clinicians to be doing the right thing by us uh, when we uh, go to them for care. Uh, and, and those sorts of partnerships bring us into particularly with government, bring us into some challenging spaces. They bring us into, you know, let's be candid, uh, sometimes Faustian packs uh, with government. Um, you know, communities that carry the burden of HIV, you know, sex work, uh, we still don't have, um, uh, you know, uh, evidence-based laws in most states and territories in Australia. Drug use remains criminalised rather than treated as a health issue. Uh, homosexuality was, uh, was decriminalised in most states after, well after, uh, the HIV epidemic hit. So, so entering into a dialogue with government for criminalised communities, for marginalised communities, you know, this is, this is not easy. Uh, sitting at the table with people who fundamentally don't understand us, um, who, um, who in not understanding us need us to help us to navigate this with them. That's, that's, that's hard, hard work, hard conversations, and there's a cost to those conversations. Um, but I think those partnerships are really important for getting through a crisis that's bigger than what we can do as individuals and as communities. Um, and I think there's also a deal for us as community leaders, which is, you know, our job, my job isn't simply to be a mouthpiece for communities. Uh, it's to also help within our communities to make sense of what's happening to us, to navigate the diversity of voices and experiences within communities, um, to think about what's going to help us as a community to get through this as best we can. Uh, and to understand that, uh, you know, first and foremost, uh, we're people, we're, we're people uh, living our lives uh, our imperfectly and, uh, and there aren't good people and bad people within our communities. There's just us uh, and we're doing our best and we're going to navigate this as best we can together uh, and, uh, and we're going to help each other to do that. Uh, that's, that's the kind of pact. It's uh, uh, community leadership is both upwards and inwards, um, but, it's, uh, but it's about... Um, trying to get us all to a better place uh, and using the consent and the strengths of communities to get us there. And Daryl, um, you know, just with the, and Victor, the way Daryl described, I, I mean, there's a long history there and plenty of stories to be shared, I imagine, about, <laughs> as you say, sometimes very challenging moments with government, with decision makers, um, the power dynamics there, the complexity of that. I'm just interested, but Victor, if you could share with us um, you know, knowing, as you know, Daryl said, you know, this extraordinary history of community, existing community leadership, you know, this notion that somehow you've got to be validated in another place to be even seen, let alone get your foot in the door and to, you know, have power in some of the decision making um, and that we're in a federated government environment. What are some of your views about where we've got to with partnership with government structures and what more do we need to be calling for to get a better collaboration assuming it's not where we might want it to be in you know here we are at September yeah we're you know we're we're in the next stage of a cycle of where communities are going to be asked a lot to respond to the you know what's happened with the bushfires already and what's coming you know coming into the future so particularly about the relationship with government, your views and of where we're at with that. 
and what you need? Well, firstly, um, yeah, like Daryl was saying, you know, it's, um, it's exactly the, the same way for um, all issues, I think, with, that are affecting community. We, it really is about the community leadership and the community's, um, you know, being the solution. And that's the same thing with the fire, you know. It's what we've been focusing on the whole time is the community because um, it's going to be the communities that are going to do that work. It's the communities that get affected from the, the crisis um, and, um, and it's the opportunities that we want to give to our children to carry on um, the positive um, solutions into the future. And they're the jobs and, um, you know, that's the culture. And that only just tells us that we need the um, community to drive the, um, the processes and governments should be supporting the community to do that. I mean, that's what they're there for, isn't it? I mean, aren't they public servants? Um, to support the community's initiatives. And um, that's the way it should, should be in my eyes. And, um, you know, it's been a long journey and so many challenges in um, going up against um, trying to get the government agencies just to support programs. And a lot of that um, has been really challenging simply because um, Indigenous knowledge hadn't been supported by government um, in the past. And it's slowly changing and it's a and it's great to see it slowly changing, but we still got a way to go before um, we get really full support there and the attention of the government to, um, to support the programs that we're trying to develop. Um, but all the successes to date, um, and I think I believe is part of changing the government and getting the government on board is um, being all the work that the communities have engaged in on the ground. And, you know, we've developed our first training pro pilot programs now We've created fire sticks um, to support communities. Um, you know, there's communities all over Australia that are that are willing to engage in these programs and not just with fire, but beyond as well. And I think that is, is significantly changing. And we just need to just keep on going, creating those successes on the ground. And there is a lot of support in the philanthropy sector as well. And I really believe that um, it's going to take everyone to get on board. And, um, you know, we just need to change, you know, that same old way where we just wait for the government to make the first move. We can't, we can't afford that because we don't have time and um, we need to get into, um, you know, we need to get solutions happening immediately and we need to, um, to give people the skills they need to um, take on the challenges into the future. And um, we need to do all of that um, at the same time. And, you know, because we basically don't have time to waste. So a lot of communities are, are doing that. There are, have been some um, initiatives that the government has have supported through these programs with the Indigenous Rangers program, but that only goes for certain communities around the country. There are so many communities that are missing out and, um, and that deserve an opportunity to um, look after their country because they live in an, an amazing place and have such amazing values. You know, we have communities that are struggling in Western Australia that hold the great Western woodlands, you know, one of the biggest um, temperate woodlands in the world. And, um, and they're struggling to try and get their management programs going in there. And, um, you know, we continue to try and have to talk with government and we, um, you know, and through fire sticks, we're trying to lobby with government and we've been involved in all the Royal Commission's processes and the Koala Court processes and, um, but, you know, I'm really still yet to see some concrete um, support and outcomes um, from that yet. And, um, and I'm, you know, you're always, you, you never, you're never holding your breath, but uh, always fingers crossed and, and hopeful that um, the government will come full swing into supporting um, these sort of programs and community-based programs into the future. Yeah, I, I, I hear there, the Vic, Victor, that, you know, just that tenacity, that dogged perseverance um, to, you know, keep pushing forward. And of course, I, I was wondering if you could provide your observations about to what extent government has responded to that just on the ground and community leadership that, you know, was extra has been extraordinary and have, has government redesigned its processes at all to better collaborate and support the leadership from community to inform what it does. Yeah, I think going back to what I was, my first sort of point, I think they, the will's there, they're, 
they're, they're definitely trying, but they're just not agile enough. And I, and I, um, you know, I'm concerned that even a lot of the, 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 the changes that they're trying to implement, um, often are replicating a lot of those sort of uh, top-down approaches rather than sort of really sort of situating communities at the centre of the response um, and and ensuring that the resources are um, uh, and the, and the organisations that, that that work with them that, that they're they're appropriately valued and resourced to um, to to sort of uh, deal with the deal with the, the the crisis but also support sort of recovery as well so. I, I think the will's there, but I'm just finding... So, so there's a good example. I mean, one of the things that ECCV and a lot of its members were calling for at the start of the um, pandemic was the, was the need for some strategic coordination as concerns are culturally diverse communities. So we were calling for the creation of a, of a, called, a called task force. Uh, and there were other examples of that. So the Victorian government stood up a, an Aboriginal Communities Task Force quite early on, which was great, which include Aboriginal community control organisations. Mm-hmm. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, chaired by the Minister. Uh, similarly, uh, there was a, a COVID disability task force uh, chaired by the Minister that was set up quite early on that included advocates, key advocates, key, key peak bodies um, and, and other sort of sector providers. Uh, so again, sort of doing the right thing in terms of situating community voices at the centre of, uh, of of considered of a considered response, that didn't occur with uh, multicultural communities. Um, there was an announcement in August where where a called communities task force has now been created by the Victorian government. But again, it's basically an interdepartmental working group. There, are, it's it, there's no community voices at the table. So. I guess that for me just sort of raises sort of that red flag that I guess a lot of the, 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 the there's a real risk that a lot of the issues that have sort of borne born out during this period might, might, might just replicate themselves. Mm. Daryl, I saw you smiling as Chris gave that example. No doubt that resonates with you, you know, times that you've seen that. Um, it looks like something, but it's actually not. Um, can you just speak a bit to, and um, we've debated this, you know, reflected on to what extent we can draw from the HIV crisis experience and to what extent this is very different, you know, dealing with the COVID pandemic mm. and any observations about what different approaches might be needed and where you do see there's very similar, you know, aspects to it. Uh, it's interesting because there are differences and there are, you know, very powerful par- parallels. Um, you know, if we think about <clears throat> the the big pandemics, the big health crises that have shaken the ground uh, in the last hundred years. Uh, you know, there's HIV and there's COVID, uh, and they've hit our communities. Uh, they've completely uh, they've become front page, top of the policy agenda, uh, consumed public discussion, and uh, as governments have grappled with what on earth are we going to do with this thing that is terrifying all of us? Um, I think uh, uh, I think there was uh, some uh, very powerful and good things happening in the beginning of the COVID response. You know, there was a moment that I think we all remember where you'd go to the supermarket uh, and you'd be really, you know, quite concerned about who was near you and uh, physical distancing and if someone walked past you too closely, it was kind of, you know, you were aware of it. You didn't go to the supermarket unless you needed to. And, and do you remember that moment where we were all trying not to touch our faces uh, and working out how to sneeze into an elbow without that feeling more, uh, you know, a little bit more gross than uh, sneezing into a tissue or something like that? So there was a moment where um, people and communities were very, very highly active and mobilised around what is it that I can do? What is it that I do myself uh, with my loved ones, in my family, in my neighbourhood um, that help to respond to this uh, to this uh, crisis, um, that is that that experience in COVID is all of the hallmark of the HIV response. I think what's happened subsequently, though, is unlike HIV, uh, political leaders remain centred in COVID, uh, and so the you know the the big narratives at the moment aren't about what's needed, what's happening at community level, how we're coping, how we're responding, and how we need to adapt. The big conversations are about border wars, uh, nonsense that's, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to 
hard to imagine that those discussions are little more than, you know, approaching state elections. Um, that's not about COVID. That's not about communities. That's not about families. Um, so there's uh, the political centering in COVID is very different to what we've seen in HIV. Uh, the other thing that is uh, very different is the ascendancy of public health. So in the HIV response, uh, there were no tools. Uh, at first, there wasn't a test. When there was a test, uh, you could be diagnosed with HIV, but there was no treatment, right? So you were just simply diagnosed knowing that you had now what was a, a fatal condition. Um, so all of the things that government instinctively reaches for, treatments, vaccines, cures, tests, um, contact tracing, all of those things, not available in the same way in HIV, so utterly dependent on community and this partnership with community, whereas in COVID, uh, you know, particularly in Victoria, I think we've seen, you know, uh, something like three and a half thousand contact traces mobilised. Um, but, but those contact traces are mopping up after the event. Uh, they're mopping up problems that have occurred. And what's been lost in the discussion is that what got the cases, what's driving those cases down in Victoria from, you know, what, 700, 700 plus down to, you know, 40 or so a day at the moment. Uh, isn't contact tracing, it's not Dan Andrews and it's not the PM either. It's actually people um, sacrificing things in their own lives. It's, uh, you know, mum making a decision, I've really got to get to work today and get the kids, uh, get the kids sorted, but I've woken up with a sore throat and I'm not going to leave the house or I'm going to go get a test. Like that's, that's a personal sacrifice. It's people losing income. It's people um, uh, experiencing all of the things that go on with COVID um, and also making the little choices as well. I'm going to sneeze into my elbow. You know, I'm going to try not to touch my face. I'm going to avoid seeing Nana. Um, those are the things, those are the individual things that communities, neighbourhoods, families do that are helping to drive down infection. And none of those things are being valued. You know, I don't see any of that in the media. I don't see any of that when I listen to political leaders. I don't hear them saying, what an amazing job uh, you're doing as communities. What an amazing job you're doing as people. We've got to keep this up uh, because there's not a technical fix for this. And so I think part of that, you know, it's not to criticise political leaders, it's not to criticise media either. They're, they're doing what they're, uh, they're operating exactly as they're intended to operate. Uh, media aren't our cheer squad. Uh, they're there to report the news. Um, I think we have to be better at being our own cheer squad and celebrating the strengths of community, uh, of, um, of talking, of, of emphasising that this is the solution, as Chris and Victor have so eloquently said, and how this is the solution, get better at telling that story, uh, that it's community action that's making the difference and it's community action that's precious and needs to be sustained, you know. Um, all of the, the sort of uh, breathless talk of a vaccine, uh, gee whiz, um, I'm not sure there's going to be a vaccine in quite the time frames that people are talking about. And so... You know, we were talking about a vaccine for HIV in 1985. Um, I'm hopeful, you know, I'm confident it won't take that long with COVID. You know, I'm assured by good scientists. But, but we've got to get through this and we've got to get through it sustainably. We've got to live inside a pandemic and that's about us as people, not about other people doing things to us or for us. Uh, and we have to be part of telling that story. Yeah. Um, thanks, Daryl. Look, um, I know we've got um, still, um, you know, more people now actually joining the webinar, so we're not losing. This is obviously a really important discussion for people, and so just, again, you know, welcoming people who have been joining over the course of this discussion. Um, and Chris, hi, Chris Newton from um, Mountains Community uh, Resource Network, fantastic community leader, and Chris, you um, just has made some comments. She just wanted to say, look, fantastic insights um, and her experience also responding to the crisis, the two major bushfires to date, um, is that you've all put your finger on the central issue, which is that, you know, it, over, overarching, essentially government do, does not have direct channels of communication to work with community at the grassroots um, and that often government can rely on, you know, a, a, a community leaders self-nominating, um, sometimes local place community service organisations to be the voice for the communities, but then don't even trust all the validity or professionalism of those voices. And so, as Victor, you said, it's, you know, it is community that has the solution. And just... Chris is just inviting you to comment a bit further on that, I guess, for a moment, thinking about community dynamics... 
um, and your observations of what, what you have seen about the strength of collaboration amongst community um, individuals, community organisations, and where we need to rethink how we're going about things. Vic, did you want to comment a little bit on that or if anybody else would like to jump in as well? Victor first. Um, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we've got a lot of work to do. And when we look at all our problems from pandemic to environment and all those crises, you know, like what people have got to really got to remember is that, is that people are a part of the country and the country is a part of people. Yeah. And we can't I look at just healing the landscape without healing our society and people. And, um, and we can't look after this landscape if we continue to have problems within our society and division within our society. And, you know, it's, I'm really glad that this, this conversation is bringing up community because, you know, we've really got to bring back that community. You know, we've got to bring back the, you know, the fact that when I was a kid that, you know, we had local tomato growers in our community selling local markets. We've had, you know, the bus drivers, people collecting the rubbish for us. And, you know, like community was, was there. And we start to lose that. And when we start to see the problems that are happening today, we, it's a sure sign that we do start to lose, um, you know, a lot of our community capacity when we can't deal with the um, catastrophes that are going on. And yes, we are responding good and we help each other when we're in real need and trouble, but um, I think we just need to get more capacity around our communities to really drive solutions and get out there and, and make a difference. And to do that, we need to, to educate people and we need to support people with um, the knowledge and programs. And, and um, I just, I'm just so strongly on that. And that's just what I would lo really love to see right across the board. Um, and um, there's a lot of work to do in this, in, this, in this place because, you know, we're continuously divided. And when we look at the, even our leaders in this country, the political leaders are always divided from each other. They're always chucking spanners at each other. Um, you know, we can't do that. And that, re that reflects onto our communities. And then we have communities that dividing each other over the same issues and taking sides. Um, that is just um, what we don't need. What we need is everyone on the same page and start working together. And, um, and I think that's going to be um, a big part of awareness around this country that we need to strengthen the capacity of our communities and, you know, with truth and love and, and start working hard to um, take on the solutions into the future. Yeah, so beautifully put, Victor. I, and this, this, um, I suppose this notion of to what extent do we continue to focus on what we want government to do differently or to what extent that there's a great richness in us giving a sort of a strong focus to how, what is within our control and what can we do differently? And yeah. Chris, any observations from you on, on that? And, and then I'll come to you, Daryl. Yeah, I think, you know, in a moment like this, there's a real risk that we can be, you know, wedged, as, as Victor was saying, you know, and, and we've, seen it, we've seen it here in Victoria where, um, you know, particular particular ethnic groups have have been uh, called out in the media as being a cause for a surge in infections, and and obviously that probably wouldn't be too dissimilar to the H HIV pandemic, where you know the uh, the gay community was obviously the uh, the you know the, the responsible responsible group. Um, so I think sort of building on what Daryl said, I think it's just the, this whole thing about really sort of highlighting those real positives, those those strengths those strengths that exist within our communities, drawing those out, really celebrating them because, you know, that is, that is the hope that, you know, we can't be, we can't be relying on government, as you said, Cassandra, to sort of give us the solutions all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, we've seen that, we've seen that time and time again, both, uh, you know, in the bushfires earlier this year. I mean, I was, I was in awe that the, the Afghani here, Afghani community here in Victoria raised more than a million dollars for bushfire victims. I mean, that, that just really, you know, this is a this is obviously in a new a new and emerging community that you know probably has its own resource challenges. But here they were, you know, just showing I guess how just how how um, how connected they were to 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 a broader sense of belonging and community. The fact that they would make a sacrifice like that. So I think just sort of highlighting those sort of uh, those 
those those good things that happen from our community and making sure that the resources go to those people and, and those groups that are working on the ground day, day in, day out to, to make sure that people are safe and included. Daryl, comments from you? I mean, as you say, Chris, what an extraordinary story and, you know, um, the, the sort of how to make that visible and how for that to be the front you know, on the front of the websites, the media outlet websites, other than some other stories. Um, and, you know, again, Daryl, you would have seen a lot of that over the years of tackling HIV, you know, AIDS crisis, right? Um, and what, what caught the attention of the public and what was never properly acknowledged. What are your observations about what we could do differently? What's within our control to do differently? Uh, I think there's a... Um... I think there's a, a, a challenge here because, you know, we're talking in this forum about community leadership, right? And, and community leadership is drawn from authenticity and uh, and, and speaking uh, speaking truth uh, and having the license to, um, to to provide a voice to government or to media, community, um, uh, public. Um, that's actually a very challenging thing for government. You know, as I've been reflecting as we've been having this discussion. You know, if I was sitting in you know, the Department of uh, Health uh, or, uh, you know, in a uh, state and territory bureaucracy and I've got uh, just, you know, $70 million has just landed on the, on the desk and here's a problem that I've got to solve and the minister wants, uh, uh, wants solutions by, uh, by tomorrow at midday. What do I do? And I'm listening to this discussion and I'm hearing about the strength of community and the resilience of community and the solution is the community. And I've got my pen poised and I don't know what to write because I don't think government anymore knows how to value what it is we're talking about. Uh, so I've got that $70 million, and what do I write to the minister tomorrow? I write, oh, okay, well, hang on, there's this service provider, and they could provide, you know, 30 widgets of that at, uh, you know, at 100 occasions of service over this time period, right? Uh, and that's very easy for government to think in those very technical ways about what some of the solutions are, for government to think about, well, what would it mean for us to have a dialogue uh, with community about what is needed and how that's best delivered and how we harness the strengths that already exist and build on those, that's a much harder art. And so I think there's something lost in the art of government here. Um, I'm not sure that gets us to what do we do about it, um, but I do think it's, a, a, it's, it's part of us sharpening the story. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are, there are people that provide services in the public sector, in the community, the not-for-profit sector, uh, and there are community uh, leadership roles. Um, you know, I think uh, Chris... Uh, uh, made some really lovely observations. But the, the one thing I, I really do wonder about, though, is I don't think we're that hard to find. Um, I think government can find us. You know, we're not hard to reach. We're right here. And uh, and I think, you know, whether it's through the leadership that Nacho and Pat, Pat Turner have uh, shown in terms of bringing together that coalition of organisations to partner with government on closing the gap, um, uh, whether it's uh, reaching out to... Uh, to FECA or to, uh, you know, state and territory uh, ethnic communities councils. There are, there are mechanisms for engaging with community that have standing and legitimacy and authority. Uh, and perhaps our discipline is to be tougher in terms of making the distinction that community leadership matters and we expect, uh, whether it's in the disability area, whether it's with um, uh, migrant communities, whether it's with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities or whether it's with uh, LGBTIQ communities, we expect government to be engaging in a dialogue. And, um, and when I say, as a community leader, sorry, it's not that simple, um, I can't turn what you want into 30 widgets of activity and, by the way, I've got diversity that I'm, I'm dealing with, there's mess here, um, but that's to be okay rather than when government goes to a service provider and they say, sure, we can give you that activity. Because it is messy. Community uh, is, uh, is not something we control. Uh, it's something we lead. And I think government, uh, we need to tell the story better uh, to government of how we can partner, but also the limits of what they can ask of us uh, in terms of um, uh, how we bring community uh, to the table with solutions. Great, Daryl. Look, I, and James Whelan. Hi, James, who's from the Climate Action Network Australia, was just commenting. He's saying that, you know, the discussion that we're having highlights for him the importance of building strong dialogue and relationships 
within and between different civil society groups and interested to hear your thoughts, panellists, um, on that how strong and linked up are Australian civil society groups and what could we do to further strengthen those links. Victor, do you want to comment on that first? Well, getting many of the organisations to, um, we need to pull them all together. And um, there's also, you know, a whole new way of working even for everyone, you know, not just for communities, but also for agencies, um, you know, that are running these initiatives. Um, and, and um, you know, they also need to, um, to come to planning meetings and meetings to talk about how they structure themselves to support community best as well. Because we've sort of had the past models where, um, you know, a group would say, well, this is the work that we're doing and this is what we're doing into the future. And the communities at the bottom in small print, um, they're the ones doing the work, um, you know, and, and we can't have agencies just um, using the banner of community just to show how great they are. We need agencies to start rethinking how they operate. Um, we need agencies to start working with other agencies and working together. And they need to be putting the shoulders behind um, the community in a way that um, the agencies, are, the communities are seeing clear support from these agencies hitting the ground. And I'm not speaking in a way that all agencies have um, have been uh, have just been self-centred. I mean, a lot of them are doing really well, but particularly in this recent um, crisis with the bushfires, I've seen a big change in the agencies um, that are saying, "Okay, we're here to help, and we're going to listen how we're going to help." And we're going to um, not drive it, but we're going to push in behind and give you a hand and, um, with the solutions that are already working from, from the grassroots level. And, and that's really great. And that's what we need to see. We need to see um, collaborativeness and we need to see open minds into looking at different ways of doing things. And, you know, this is not just about training for people to light fires um, and training just for Aboriginal people. This is... This is, um, you got to look at it from every perspective. Everyone needs to look at this in a different light and start to apply their services and the way that, um, their, and their values in a way that um, is more collective and putting their shoulders behind um, um, community um, successes rather than trying to lead and um, um, lead the processes themselves and put themselves into the, into the light of success. And, um, and I think um, that's going to be important because... You know, the, the, the problems we're dealing with is huge and we're going to need everyone on board. And when we, if we're going to look at funding such a thing as, you know, looking after our land better and educating this nation, then what we need is everyone um, on board working together because it's going to take all of us and not one organisation or nation or, or individual or group can do it on their own. And, um, and that's something we've got to come into terms with. And, um, and in these early stages, that's what we are looking at trying to promote, is working together and putting our shoulders behind us, um, the same successes and celebrate those same successes. Yeah. And, and Chris, with the, that question of, from James about, you know, do, do we need to work harder on the collaboration amongst civil society groups? Um, and, you know, crises and fear can, you know, lead to a whole range of different dynamics in community. What are your observations about where we're at at that? Uh, would you say on balance we're seeing stronger collaboration or has there been a lot of fracturing of relationships? Uh, no, I think the collaboration has been within the uh, sector has been pretty, pretty, pretty significant mm -hmm. um, and really encouraging. I guess for communities, though, I think the issue, and this sort of builds on what both Daryl said in terms of this whole idea of, you know, you've got X amount of dollars and, you know, the, the, for, you, know you, you get X number of widgets for, 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 for your money. I think that that, you know, and, and, and what Victor was saying about, you know, not just sort of, you know, going to community and sort of saying, here's a solution. It's, uh, you know, I've heard it from a, a number of new and emerging communities is saying, yeah, we're sick of being uh, asked to, you know, find participants or, or, or referrals for, you know, larger, larger community service providers. Like, you know, we'll give you a voucher if you come to our consultation. You know, we've got the solutions. We want to be able to deliver the services. So I think it's incumbent on um, civil society to look at, um, 
how does it work with sort of uh, smaller emerging sort of grassroots organisations to build their capacity as well, rather than sort of, as, as the other panellists have said, coming in to provide a solution? Yeah, great. Uh, Daryl, any, anything you'd want to add to uh, those comments from Victor and Chris? Uh, I think just to, to acknowledge the burden is really high, isn't it? Like none of us are going to agree that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're stronger together. Uh, we know that. Uh, the, uh, the deeper our collaboration, the, the more powerful our voice. Um, but, uh, gee whiz, uh, finding the time in the day um, to build meaningful partnerships uh, is, is it, it's, it's real. Um, you know, for, for me and Chris to get together and to talk about, you know, what's happening for you, Chris, and what does that look like and in all of its complexity and, uh, and, and what do you need? And, and, and this is kind of what it looks like from my end. Bringing that together and actually creating true understanding, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big job. So I think, I think partnerships have a cost uh, as well as a value. And I think part of the challenge for us as communities is uh, how to find the balance. We've also got organisations like yours, Cass, that um, you know that we need to be supporting and championing to to help us to tell the story and um, to help you back us in uh, in the ways that you do with government. Um, uh, but I think uh, I think at the grassroots level, the uh, you know the collaboration is often amazing. Uh, I think once you get into uh, to organisations, uh, the sort of further up the food chain you get, the more fractious it can be, the more political it can be. Uh, but, but certainly I don't detect any lack of goodwill uh, in, um, on the ground. I've got a great question here from Timor, actually. We're going to talk about power for a moment, <laughs> um, which is kind of at the heart of all this in one way, you know, um, where um, this sort of the question about to what extent, you know, you know with this um, perceived real shift of power to sort of elected officials and experts, and the dominance of health advice and the same thing, championing of that, you know, science-based, evidence-based, um, is that challenging some of the w wisdom of other sources of knowledge and community? Um, and um, Cassandra Armstrong from Financial Council was just saying, she, you know, she's sort of seen this. I was involved in the Yalo Purina fire recovery in WA in 2016. And, you know, with all the community service and government representatives working together from the One Resource Centre, um, allowed a lot of knowledge sharing, good representation, cohesive responses from the community um, and really felt that it was a sort of a best practice example of that more grassroots approach rather than sort of the elite, you know, um, professionalised uh, expert type model. You know, who is the expert? So just any comments from any of you on that one? And maybe I'll just throw in the, how do we tackle this issue of funding arrangements and, you know, the culture of competition which is often foisted upon community organisations and civil society groups, you know, trying to, you know, recognise good work, provide jobs, Victor, you know. Employment's guess, really important, yeah? Yeah, I guess for me it's... Um and for all the work that's been done around the fire space with communities, it's about community mentoring community and um, helping communities to rebuild their knowledge on their own landscapes. And the community mentoring community approach is really beautiful because it's one community that's doing really well that goes to help another community. And when we bring them all together, they share their successes and they, be, they develop a network. And then they realise that they're not alone. And that has been the driving um, success around all the firework in the past. It's been sharing that responsibility and um, sharing knowledge to create so many faces that um, are experts in their own landscapes and in their own spaces and regions. And building that is, has, has been the ultimate, you know, the, the main drive for us. Um, and now we see... We have so many great practitioners around the country and so many communities that can speak strongly um, on panels, um, to media, and um, above all, get out there and actually conduct um, pra the practical. And it's the practical is what we're aiming at, getting out there and actually doing the work. And so we'll continue that model of, just, of community mentoring and community and continue to develop thousands of faces that can speak and advocate the goodwill of um, this of the solutions into the future and and that's what we should be seeing and not just seeing one face and one expert 
um, speaking or or just one agency or just the government speaking. Um, we need to see that, um, you know, if we see that collectively across the board and we have, we're building on that expertise and we're seeing community mentoring and community models, then, we, um, then no doubt we, um, you know, it'll be a sign that we're moving in the right direction and that we're, we're evolving culture um, as a whole. And that's what um, we need to see. We need to see, um, you know, walking libraries in all communities and professionals right across the board in all communities and in, in, in every sector that is vital to um, the future of um, our community and country. Beautiful, Victor. Chris or Daryl, any comments on that? I, I personally don't want to add anything further. I think that was just perfect, actually. Yeah. I think, I think for me, it's all about credibility and trust and, uh, and a really deep understanding of what it is we're talking about. So, so for me, the, you know, the question of experts, you know, where would we be without them? You know, where would we, you know, when we think about civil society, we're thinking about a really, really big, broad church of different, uh, different people who, um, who bring uh, their wisdom to bear on, on the challenges we all face. Um, but community leadership within that is is very special and important. And so, um, you know, when we talk about an expert, well, an expert in what? Uh, you know, an expert in COVID? Well, how does that help me in terms of my lived experience? Um, I think, you know, when I think about the sorts of challenges that COVID's thrown up, when I think about the example that Chris uh, gave of a million dollars raised for uh, by the Afghan community for, um, uh, for bushfire relief, that didn't happen because some experts stood up and said, you know, there's been a bushfire. It happened because uh, Afghan community leaders uh, and community members came together and said, let's do something together um, uh, in response to this. Um, the really profoundly striking thing for me about COVID is uh, the absence, the almost complete and utter, uh, total absence of community education. Uh, I think there's been a couple of, uh, you know, uh, mainstream uh, uh, TV campaigns, um, but that's the least of it, isn't it? The community education that is meaningful for us is uh, delivered to us, given to us, shared with us um, by people that uh, we look to for guidance in our lives. Uh, if, I'm a, if I'm a sex worker whose uh, entire income, um, productive income capacity has just been detonated by COVID, um, I'm not listening to the, CM, the chief medical officer and I'm not listening to the, the police minister standing beside them or the police commissioner. Uh, they're the last people I'm listening to. I'm listening to people within my own community who are going to, who are also muddling through this, trying to make sense of it. Uh, what do we do? How do we do? How do we keep ourselves safe? How do we keep uh, our clients and others safe? Uh, they're the people I'm listening to. And, uh, and it's really striking to me that, uh, that we're missing. So community is there, community is doing its best, but it's not being resourced and empowered to actually help with the messaging, um, help government, help uh, public official, um, help experts, uh, and, you know, dare I say it, even help the police and the defence force uh, some, who've somehow got in help, involved in a, in a health issue, um, but to help them carry the story within communities in ways that have authenticity and trust and that are reflective of the lived realities for people in those communities. Yeah, I'm, I'm smiling, Daryl, because both in the uh, face of the bushfires last year and then as the crisis of COVID unfolded, the very first paragraphs and the very first letters from myself to the Prime Minister was about that. You know, we are a net, we're networks of thousands of community organisations with, you know, right through into very grassroots environments yeah. with a lot of very high trust relationships and a key capacity for communications. Yeah. That was the first, very first offer was for us to work in that way and we'll continue, we offer that again today. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, it's also worth saying, um, you know, this isn't, uh, you know, we expect billions, uh, you know, we expect rivers of gold to be flowing out of Treasury in order to, to resource this. This is, um, you know, as government, uh, there's a challenge that we see for our society um, can you help us? We value the leadership you bring within your communities, the standing you have. Um, when you're at the pulpit, uh, when you're talking to your uh, workplace delegates as a trade union uh, official, um, when you are um, talking in your community media about the issues that are presenting, could you share these messages and help us to carry the word of? Um, you know, there are 
there are some supports that are needed in order to bring that to scale and to achieve intensity. Um, but the goodwill is there. But what it requires is a recognition and a respect by government uh, that there's another part of the puzzle that they haven't actually recognised and that can help to be part of the solution. Yeah, I mean, Victor, it, you know, outside of um, sort of the, uh, all the work that's been been done through First Nations community controlled organisations, it was sort of this marvelling about how did that happen? How did that success happen? And of course, the power of storytelling and sharing knowledge and those trusted relationships, that is glue that just no government policy is undone, really, you know, in that sense of at the front line, so many Aboriginal leaders and communities locally around the country. I don't underestimate the resources that would have been much better <laughs> you know, to back in that work. But, um, the, you know, the power and the effectiveness of that approach was just patently clear, wasn't it? Uh, but the personal price yeah, that gets that's right. paid, you know, for not being properly resourced to do that. Because um, communi communities yeah, still right. do the work, yeah? Yeah, I mean, like, everything that we've done to this day has been on the smell of an oily rag, you know, and <laughs> pulling together what we can. And um, and still we're still doing that. We haven't stopped um, operating that way. And I think um, you know we always will be operating that way until you know, like um, Daryl said, you know, the river of gold points in the right direction. But at the moment, the river of gold is going down the drain, um, with billions of dollars going from wildfires and the loss of property, and you know, and let's say um, it's absolutely priceless to to lose our native vegetation and to lose our um, animals and to see our land get um, destroyed. Um, you know, we can't allow that to happen. And so, you know, just a fraction of that river of gold that's going down the drain at the moment can come in the right direction and um, actually, you know, fertilize goodwill in an environment and our community to, um, to um, you know, create greater prosperity from that. It would be amazing. And um, I think it all boils down to um, leading with example. And that's one thing that has been a real strong point for um, Indigenous knowledge issues. And that is, um, you know, doing things the Indigenous way, which is, um, you know, doing, doing the actual practical. And so everything we've, been, we've done has been lighting the fires and getting people on country and actually doing the work and giving them that experience. And... Um, and I think that's what's going to lead the way into the future is, is just getting out there and making it happen. And, um, you know, we can't just talk all the time. We need to show how, how it's done as well. And, um, and when we don't show how it's done, then we continue to just be talking and doing debates. And yeah. you know, I think we're all sort of past that now and people want to see action on the ground and people want to see things moving forward and, you know, and, and um, you know, and there's so many Aboriginal communities that have come together to make this where it is today. But not only just Aboriginal people, there's so many of the non-Indigenous sector in Australia that are a part of this now. And, you know, and it's just clear now that it's everyone's in this together. And, um, and it's just so great to see everyone working together and from all different sectors. And um, I'm really privileged um, to be able to say that today um, for everyone to hear that it is such a great thing that's happening in this country um, a midst of what we're talking about with all the challenges. And, um, you know, we've got good things going and I see positive change moving into the future, you know. Yeah. Victor and others, we're starting to come towards the end of, you know, such a rich, wow, you know, so much, so much knowledge and insight and learning and I you know, can really sense, um, you know, how much people have been engaged in this um, in terms of the thinking. We've got just in formulating maybe some of your last comments on the broad topic of community leadership. Victor, you might want to respond to the question from Ingrid about, you know, the interaction between sort of climate change science and traditional practice as an example of, you know, track change. Um, and the other question was just, do we need to rethink the notion of community? Um, and so maybe just um, if we just go, Victor, Chris and Daryl, any final observations? And in your case, Victor, a, a response on, yeah. on that well, I'll take, I'll take the climate change one and then I'll leave the yeah. community one for the other yeah. followers. Okay. But, um, 
Yeah, so like over all the years of doing this work and dealing with the changing climates and since the climate change issues um, over the last decade or more, um, I can really say that it hasn't affected the way that we manage the land. And um, yes, it's changed um, a timing for some specific um, circumstances, like burning a little bit later or burning a little bit earlier. Um, um, but most of our um, adaptation is around the unbalanced country and around country that is really sick and um, that is um, not healthy and has an inundation of like weeds or a real serious problem. And that's where uh, a lot of our adaptation is coming in more regularly. Um, but of course, we've been adapting to the changing climates and been um, burning when it's raining in, in the winter times and doing storm burns in winter. And I've, so I've been doing that, and it, which is usually in January and February and burning certain ecosystems at that time because that's when the rain came um, because of the shift in those weather patterns. And it's just simply ad adapting, shifting. And, um, and we've been successfully been able to do that and have good outcomes with country. Um, so for me personally, um, you know, like, we just need to adapt. And I haven't seen anything too challenging um, for me to be able to apply um, fires to landscape with the climate change um, when we have this, uh, um, this wealth of knowledge and baseline to work from. Um, but I can say this, if I do one day come up on the media or I do do an announcement to say that our practices aren't working anymore because of the changing climates, then that's when you need to worry. <laughs> Yeah, but that's not the case at the moment. Thank you, Victor. Chris? Yeah, I probably, that's pretty, uh, that, that, that whole idea that, you know, uh, all, that, all that wisdom might not be relevant anymore, that's a real worry, I think, Victor, so hopefully that doesn't come to bear. But uh, I just, uh, for me, sort of that key question of, of community and uh, community leadership, I mean, I'll probably go back to Anian's uh, Welcome to Country and, and I think the, uh, you know, and, and building on what Victor said, I think we need to definitely rethink, you know, the whole idea of, uh, of community control um, and, and self-determining needs uh, within, within our very diverse uh, nation. Um, so, you know, that, that may be a, a consequence of COVID-19 where I guess sort of there might need to be a rethink in the way that um, power is shared, power is distributed and, and resources are uh, uh, flow through to communities. So, you know, I guess, I guess all of us would, can keep advocating for that in our own ways and for our own, for our own groups. Thank you so much, Chris. Daryl? Uh, I, uh, I think for me the... The theme I come back to is, uh, you know, is uh, the theme we started on and, and Victor highlighted that, um, uh, you know, communities, communities are mobilising around the things that are important to them, irrespective of whether that's rec recognised, valued, um, supported by government. Uh, in the HIV response, uh, you know, part of my job is to keep government at the table for as long as I can, uh, but I know that this epidemic uh, will still be continuing uh, long after government has uh, has walked away and the community response to the epidemic will continue because it's not determined by government. Uh, the community response is all about people doing the things that make sense in the context of their lives, uh, looking out for ourselves, looking out for our loved ones. And I think that's the power of the discussion today and I think it's the power of community that, uh, uh, that, we, uh, that we are uh, independently uh, strong. Uh, regardless of, um, of of how that's valued or recognised. So although there's a really tough journey to get, get better recognition, get better support for the power of the solutions that we hold, um, I think we should also look to the strengths we have as community leaders and as communities that uh, actually, you know, we get it, uh, even, if, uh, even if governments don't always get it or they don't quite get it right, um, we get it. And, uh, you know, I was just reflecting on a comment that came in from... Uh, uh, from uh, from earlier on, from um, that I can't quite see now, but uh, but it talked about a catch twenty two, uh, and it was really the dilemma of if we don't pull together uh, as as communities uh, and actually back each other in and and recognise the commonality, the universal experience that we have in terms of crafting the solutions and being agents of the solutions that make sense in our lives. If we don't come together to do that, we can't ask that government actually uh, recognise us for the force we are. Uh, and so perhaps that's uh, the takeout for me 
uh, to uh, to think about how um, how I and my practice can be doing more of that. And Cass, I'll probably be tapping you on the shoulder uh, in in regards to that. But um, you know, we're we're stronger together. I just. Um on behalf of everybody who um, has listened in to the discussion today, just, just thank each of you for such great insights and, you know, careful thinking, um, you know, very practical, but also very uplifting. I, uh, Victor, you know, to speak of love is actually something very important right now, you know, to, to understand, we, we, you know, that discussion about whether we go into our boxes of who we are, understanding our basic humanity that actually does really bind us together. And, you know, you're speaking about, you know, respecting people and place, that notion of healing. Um, and, you know, Chris, that thing of really understanding the power of community and community control really works and, you know, the power of the voice. Um, and, Daryl, you also, you know, talked about the power of speaking the truth. And that's not always an easy thing to do, but it is kind of always the right thing, <laughs> the right thing to do. Um, of, of course, ICOS, we're, we're really so privileged to have the opportunity to, to, to learn, listen and to, you know, be a part of a gathering for civil society and some of the, you know, incredible thinking and work that's being done. Um, we have quite recently um, uh, proposed to the federal government very specific uh, um, uh, recommendations now for how to strengthen community partnership. We don't think that we are where we should be. Um, and um, that proposal is with the Prime Minister now, um, where we are saying we need a community partnership group to work closely ongoing with the Chief Medical Officer and the Prime Minister's office. Um, as a rapid response, as an ongoing feedback loop, the power of all the networks that we bring, um, we need to be there as real partners. Um, to secondly, um, at that national level, to have, um, you know, population groups where with specific high risk, that there are very specific strategies, again, that are being designed um, at that national level, informed from the grassroots. And thirdly, um, that... Um, uh, we believe there does need to be two dedicated commissioners inside the COVID commission with a strong focus on the realities of uh, communities that are at most high risk in this environment. Um, and um, that um, is an advocacy agenda that we will continue to push forward with. Um, and the other part of it, of course, is as so many, as so many of you shared um, about the power and the support for getting on with it, <laughs> because that's the reality. Um, you know, we have to continue to push for changes to processes, um, all that hard work, um, you know, about partnering with government, but also what's within our control. And today was within our control. So thank you for coming together. Um, thank you to all the participants and the comments that have been made. I know that there has been a lot of um, individual discussions happening as well, which is the lovely, you know, additional ability. We don't get to spend time in rooms together so much physically. I look forward to those opportunities in the future. Um, but um, on behalf of um, the ceremony of people who were part of our webinar today, um, can I firstly um, thank my colleagues at ACOS. Um, so that's Danny Previtira, um, Michelle Shackleton, John Mickelson and Edwina McDonald, who um, helped to make this happen. Um, can I thank Auntie Anne for her very, um, you know, warm and beautifully seen setting welcome to country. Um, and then to thank Victor, Chris and Daryl for joining us today. Thank you all. And we look forward to staying in touch with you. Thank you. Thank you.